Next on PIJN News, Dr. Chaps reports on these important issues. President Obama is authorizing and the U.S. is leading airstrikes against the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria and their rebels in Syria. We have an expert interview with retired Colonel John Warden who led the air campaign in Gulf War I. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt, Dr. Chaps, and you're watching PIJN News. On this show, we like to do three things. We report the news, we discern the spirits, and we pray the scriptures in Jesus' name. Are you ready to pray the news with us? In a few moments, we're gonna have an expert Skype interview with retired Air Force Colonel John Warden, a brilliant strategic thinker who led, led and designed the original air campaign in 1991 that brought down Iraq in the first Gulf War. But first, the news. Reuters reports that the United States is now leading airstrikes against ISIS rebels in Syria. The United States and its partner nations have conducted 20 airstrikes already against the Islamic State and certain strategic targets in Syria and Iraq since Wednesday, December the 3rd. This according to US Central Command. Five of six airstrikes by US military forces in that region were against the contested city of Kobani near the border with Turkey. This again, according to CENTCOM. Those strikes destroyed six Islamic State fighting positions and heavy weaponry. And now here is a one minute video from The Voice of America. U.S.-led coalition warplanes have launched numerous airstrikes against IS extremists. Officials say that is having an impact on morale and recruitment. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel. ISIL continues to represent a serious threat to American interests, our allies in the Middle East, and wields still influence over a broad swath of territory in western and northern Iraq and eastern Syria. Eagle says airstrikes are beginning to degrade the militants' fighting capacity and is denying a safe haven for extremist fighters. He notes that the campaign is only three months into what will be a multi-year effort. And as Iraqi forces build strength, the tempo and intensity of our coalition's air campaign will accelerate in tandem. The testimony comes days after President Obama authorized the U.S. military to deploy up to 1,500 more troops to Iraq. Mr. Obama is asking for $5.6 billion to help fund the campaign. Meredith Buell, VOA News, Washington. Our thanks again to VOA for that report. Now also in the news over in Iraq, U.S. and partner nations have conducted a 14-day strategic series of airstrikes, mostly targeting areas in the oil producing north of the country that is not controlled by Iraq, but is controlled by the Islamic State. Four of those airstrikes near Al Qaim destroyed checkpoints, armored vehicles, bunkers, fortifications, and a tactical unit, the US military said. Other strikes were directed at Islamic militant targets near Kirkuk, Samara, Tel Afar, and Fallujah. Two airstrikes near Mosul destroyed 11 bunkers, nine heavy weapons, a vehicle, and hit two Islamic State units. This according to CENTCOM. Well, our thanks again to Voice of America for that news and Reuters. You know, the Bible says this in Psalm 144, praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, Colonel John Warden, the air campaign strategist, will explain what's going on in Syria. Discerning the spirits that rule our politicians, Dr. Chaps will be right back. Let's take a stand with Israel today. Would you sign a petition with me? Visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org. And sign a petition to defend Israel, who is America's closest ally, certainly in the Middle East, if not in the entire world. We remember watching Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu give that speech at the UN when he warned about the making of an Islamic nuclear bomb, and that is being forged in Iran. But what are we doing now? 
the USA is negotiating with the Europeans to allow Iran to continue to develop nuclear material. Well, that's not right. Do we really trust this man, Hassan Rouhani, the president of Iran, who is the former nuclear weapons chief? You don't think they're gonna build a nuclear bomb when his predecessor, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, literally threatened to wipe Israel off the map of history. Now, we need to take a stand. Why is American foreign policy to fund the Muslim Brotherhood? Let's sign a petition to stop that. Stop sending our taxpayer dollars to fund the Muslim Brotherhood. And let's also sign a petition to protect the Jewish homeland. Both of those are available today at our website, PrayInJesusName.org. And when you sign those petitions, we will fax them to Congress. Instead, the failed foreign policy of the Obama administration, starting with Hillary Clinton and now John Kerry, is pressuring Israel to give up Jerusalem? Why? We should never divide the eternal capital of Israel, which is Jerusalem, and we should move the American embassy there. But instead, now the Obama administration is unfreezing the Iranian bank accounts, sending $7 billion to them on the hope of empty promises that maybe they'll stop their nuclear program. Let's defend Israel. The Jewish people are our friends. They have a right to security in their homeland. Visit PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org and sign that petition right now. Defending your religious freedom. Here is Dr. Chaps. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Chaps. We're talking about the air war against ISIS and particularly in Syria. We've said that the Obama administration has uh, pretty much declared that we're not gonna send ground troops, but we are conducting a heavy air campaign. And here joining us now via Skype from, uh, I believe it's Alabama, we're joined by Colonel John Warden, who is a, an old mentor of mine, taught me uh, the very little bit that I know <laughs> about running an air campaign and the strategy. Of, welcome, Colonel John Warden. Dr. Chaps, a pleasure, pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. When you and I last met, I believe it was 1998, I was an Air Force captain attending squadron officer school, and you gave these fascinating lectures about how to run an air campaign. In fact, you were one of the chief architects of the Gulf War in 1991. Can you talk about the book you wrote three years before that and how you, you know, were brought into the Pentagon to help coordinate that event? Well, the book that I had written uh, several years before the first Gulf War was called The Air Campaign. And what I had tried to do in that uh, book was to put together the high level ideas of the best way to use American air power, because it was clear that we were not using it very well, had not used it very effectively in Vietnam, et cetera. So uh, I happened to be on the air staff, the headquarters of the Air Force in 1990, when the Iraqis invaded Kuwait and had a group of people that uh, had given a lot of thought to the whole business of air warfare. And when the Iraqis invaded, uh, we said, hey, we have a solution to this, let's put it together. We did and uh, were able to present it to General Schwarzkopf who said, great, let's do it. And kind of the rest is history. Well, that's wonderful. I imagine uh, being in the inner circle in the basement of the Pentagon planning an entire air war against not just uh, the Iraqi Air Force, but against their entire ground forces. Of course, that was a very successful campaign and you are to be congratulated along with the entire team under the Bush administration. Uh, and then how did your, what were your, your secrets? What, what did you strategize and how did air campaigns change from how they had done, been done previously since you wrote your book and, and planned that campaign in 1991? Well, it, to some extent, I think that the probably the most important thing is that this was not a campaign that was planned against either the Iraqi Air Force or the Iraqi military, but rather it was a campaign planned against Iraq with the idea to have uh, an impact on Iraq such that we would accomplish all of our political objectives. And to that extent, that attacking the, uh, the Iraqi army, the Iraqi air force was merely a minor means to an end. The real big thing was to attack Iraq as a strategic system. And I think that's what really paid off. And that was the huge difference between what we had done in Vietnam and what we were able to do in the first Gulf War. 
So it was not just our military going up against their military, but you developed this theory, the five rings of power, or uh, can you explain how, you know, the military is only the fourth one. What are, what are the, the top three, uh, I guess, targets when you go into an air campaign? Well, what we, what, we, what we had done in the couple years prior to the first Gulf War was developed a concept that allowed somebody to think through very clearly how you would go about targeting an opponent. And what we concluded was that there were, uh, that there were five patterns of organization, five spheres of organization in any enemy, whether it's uh, the Islamic State today or whether it was Iraq then. And at the center were the leadership elements. At that time, it was uh, Hussein. Uh, then there were a variety of what we think of as processes, things like electrical generation, uh, petroleum uh, production, et cetera. Then there are some infrastructure like uh, bridges. Then there are some population uh, demographic groups. And then at the outside is the fifth ring, which is the military ring. And when you think about it that way, you realize that the fifth ring is really only a shield or a sphere. It's not the, it's not the essence of the opponent that you are dealing with. That's right. And you know, as a political science major from the Air Force Academy, I, we both went to the Air Force Academy. They taught us that war is just politics by other means. And so when you're negotiating with somebody as we were at that time with Saddam Hussein and all the UN uh, you know, peace efforts had failed, war becomes an extension of politics by a different means of negotiating, I suppose. Yes, I think that that's entirely true. So what we, what, what we, one of the major things that we had to do and to think through was really it was to, to kind of come up with what would make sense for the objectives of the United States to be in this particular operation. And so we, we, we had some ideas that were not the utter defeat and destruction of Iraq. In fact, that wasn't even particularly desirable, but a very specific idea of what we wanted Iraq to look like at the end of the war. And then we crafted the air campaign in order to create those conditions to the maximum extent possible. Now, for the past 15 years, you've been out, you're a civilian leadership counselor and, and motivational speaker, and uh, maybe you can give your own personal opinion now to how the first Gulf War ended. Did we make a mistake by not finishing the job and taking out Saddam Hussein, and then we had to go back again, I guess, 10 or 15 years later and, and do it a second time? What, were you in those discussions? Well, I, I was in some of those discussions. I certainly wasn't in the White House when the final decision was made. But I, I think there's a that sort of the, the phrasing of the question uh, is interesting. We'd say, and then we had to go back 10 or 15 years later. What we really did is we went back 10 or 15 years later. Whether we had to go back is a completely different question. When we laid this thing out for, for General Schwarzkopf, who then and then subsequently to uh, to General Powell, then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, and then he in turn briefed the president, et cetera. What our objective really was was to reduce Iraq as a strategic power so that it simply wouldn't have the ability to do another invasion of Kuwait. But uh, among other things, at the same time, it was extraordinarily important not to destroy Iraq as a functioning country able to defend itself and thereby create some huge vacuum that all kinds of strange things would happen in, people come in from the outside, et cetera, et cetera. So when we finished the Gulf War, that in my view, that Iraq was exactly where we wanted Iraq, it was no longer a problem and uh, we were able to manage the minor nuisance that existed at the time through, uh, through air patrols and some other things like that that were pretty inexpensive. So I, I, was, uh, I, was, I was satisfied with the, with the end of the first Gulf War and in fact had very specifically had a conversation with then Secretary of Defense Cheney saying, look, as we, as we conclude this war, the last thing in the world we want to do is occupy any of Iraq. I said, it's just an impossible thing to do. And he looked me in the eye and he said, I could not agree with you more. <laughs> he obviously changed his mind over the next few years. <laughs> well, that's, 
uh, you know, a different chapter of history that, you know, after 9-11 and, and Iraq, we're gonna take a short break. And when I come back, I'm gonna ask Colonel John Warden specifically about Syria and the air campaign that the Obama administration is waging against ISIS. We'll be right back after this short commercial break. Making your voice heard in our nation's capital. Dr. Chaps will be right back. Introducing FactsCongress.com. Do you care about politics, defending pro-life causes, traditional marriage, and religious freedom? At FactsCongress.com, you can create any petition to Congress, and we will convert your e-petition instantly to a real fax paper on your congressman's desk. And the best part? It's free. Want your voice heard by multiple congressmen? At FactsCongress.com, we can blast your petition to all 535 congressmen and senators instantly. And you don't even need a fax machine. Not only do we deliver your petitions instantly, but with our dashboard feature, you can quickly recruit friends on Facebook and Twitter to co-sign your petition. Do you care about a particular cause? You can build a virtual army of supporters at FactsCongress.com. Do you lead a church, faith-based organization, or PAC? We can even help you do fundraising. It's free. Just visit FactsCongress.com and try it out. Make a difference. Sign any petition today at FactsCongress.com. FactsCongress.com. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Chaps. I'm joined again by my new friend, uh, actually an old friend from 1998, Colonel John Warden one of the most strategic military thinkers in America was the primary architect, actually wrote the book that helped us design and fight the air campaign during the first Gulf War in 1991. Welcome back, Colonel Warden. Dr. Chaps, thank you very much. So since that time, sir, you were a commandant of the Air Command and Staff College, and you worked in the Air Force for many years, had a great successful career there, and then you got out and you formed Venturist, which is a leadership organization, and you wrote this new book, Winning in Fast Time. Can you explain how you apply some of your military principles to leadership? Well, what we really, what, what became very clear fairly quickly after we started working in the civilian world was that strategy is really strategy. So the, the, the principles of strategy that apply in wartime are precisely the same principles as apply for a business enterprise. The tactics are dramatically different, but the strategy formulation is virtually identical. So what we found was that we could take the ideas that we had begun to put together and had used with some success in the first Gulf War and then help uh, companies ranging from very large, like a Texas Instruments, down to garage, literal garage startups, to help them develop a strategy which would get them to much uh, to positions of higher profitability or whatever it was that they were trying to achieve. And, and that's really is the the essence of uh, of the book, Winning in Fast Time, is an explanation of the ideas, the principles of strategy that will allow anybody, a company for that matter, an individual. To, to simply do things that make a heck of a lot more sense and pay off more than other things might. And your first book, The Air Campaign, was a military book translated into seven or more languages, uh, talked about specifically how to win wars. Uh, and then your new book, Winning in Fast Time, is a, an application of some of those strategic principles to the business world. So are you available as a business consultant to come in and fix people's corporations? Yes, and that, in fact, that's the that's our primary business is really is going to companies, teaching them the the concepts of strategy, and then helping them actually to develop a strategy that's relevant for their own purposes. So, if, uh, for example, the Obama administration were to call you up next week and say, "Hey, uh, we have this." business, but it's, it happens to be in Syria and we're waging an air campaign. We hear you have some expertise in this. Uh, what would be your first thought and, and how would you begin to frame the question of how to advise the president on current policy in Syria? Well, if I were actually given that opportunity and if I found that people genuinely wanted to listen, what I would propose is it really started from the beginning. Say what are what are our what what are our real objectives in dealing with the Islamic State and secondarily with Syria perhaps? Then what are the centers of gravity? What are the key things that would need to be attacked? 
Then very, very importantly, the third question is how much time do we have to be successful, which is really is the strategic question about time. And then the fourth question is once we are successful or if we're not being successful, how are we going to get out? So those four ideas are things that need to be put together very, very carefully. And unfortunately, I, I'm not aware that any of them have been put together so far by the administration. Well, there was a big political debate in 2008. Uh, I think President Obama was then a candidate running against John McCain, who said, I wanna be in Iraq for 100 years. President Obama campaigned, I wanna get out of Iraq immediately. And you know he won and he kept that promise. For the most part, we have pulled out of Iraq ex except in an advisory role. And now you see the strategic consequences of that policy decision is that Iraq has collapsed. And you see the, the Islamic State, ISIS, has now risen to power. Should we be considering them as a bunch of rebels or are they actually a government now? Uh, I, I believe that the Islamic State is probably one of the most powerful and one of the most dangerous groups to arise in a very long time, certainly a very long time in the, in the Middle East. It's a very competent uh, group of people. They know exactly what it is that they're after, and they seem to be pretty well, uh, pretty, pretty good about organizing themselves and conducting their operations in the face of what would appear to be pretty substantial odds. So we, the last thing in the world we want to do is not to take these people seriously and not deal with them as a really, really significant threat. Well, the challenges in the on the ground there are that you know these people are ideologues. They're deeply motivated by religion and Muslim extremism is not just Al Qaeda, but now it's coalescing in this government over there. The president has said he doesn't want to send ground troops. So what is left? What can be done with an air campaign? Is it even possible to win the hearts and minds of the people? Um, so the, 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 that's a great question because I think what the real answer here is that you have got to divide the problem into two parts. If you take the hearts and minds part of the thing, that basically when you get right down to it is something with which you have enormous familiarity and that's the concept of religion. We are dealing with a religious, uh, religious situation that has not changed substantially in over 1300 years and the probability that we're gonna change it significantly in the next five years or 10 or 50 or 100 is I think close to zero. So what that does then is it says, well, is there anything we can do? And the answer is there certainly is. And the thing that we can do is to destroy the Islamic State as a functioning organization. It, it doesn't mean that the people are going to, to, to change their views on the world or anything else, but that's, that's that would be nice, but it's good enough for a while at any rate if we can break this Islamic State before it begins to coalesce and to bring in other similar groups from around the area and all of a sudden we're not dealing with just the Islamic State, but we're dealing with something now that covers not just Syria and Iraq, but also maybe Saudi Arabia, uh, maybe into Turkey, maybe into Lebanon, maybe on the, on the, on the borders of Israel. Uh, the time to break this organization is right now. And in fact, that can be done pretty effectively from the air, but it can't be done effectively in the way that we've been conducting the air operation so far. Fantastic, last question, sir, and we're almost out of time here, but uh, can you talk strategically about the relationships with those other countries that you mentioned? I know now the Obama administration has brought in allies, including Saudi Arabia and Jordan. Of course, Israel is always an ally, but I don't know how deeply they wanna be involved in fighting against Syria. And then there's Turkey on the north. Uh, can we, and are we properly leveraging those relationships in this air campaign? Um, I don't think so. And in reality, probably the, the, the ally or the, the, the state that can really do the most is really is the Assad government in Syria, which we have, uh, which we have uh, taken a sort of an opposite position with. So that, that's, the, that's the, one, the one place that is willing to fight, has the capability to do it, and has the motivation, but we're making it more difficult for Assad to fight what is important to us, the Islamic State, than we really should. 
the Turks uh, conflicted with a whole lot of things, the Jordanians probably not likely to get much outside their borders, Sunnis have a, the, 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 uh, the Saudis, as Sunnis have a lot of sets of, of, of problems they've got to resolve. The Iraqis in the south, the Shiites, they will, they will fight when they are opposed. The Kurds, probably reasonably good allies. But the, 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 to break the, the power of the state, is, of the Islamic State, is something that can probably best be done in the short term, and it needs to be done in the very short term, by American air power, and that's where we can make our major contribution. Fantastic. Our guest has been Colonel John Warden, strategic thinker, author of Winning in Fast Time. His website is Venturist.com. Thank you, Colonel, and God bless you in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps, thank you very much. We'll be right back after this short break. This is PIJN News. Can I take a moment to ask you to donate today? There are such important battles that we're fighting and winning around the country to defend religious liberty. How much is the right to pray in Jesus' name worth to you? Well, to me, it was worth a 16-year career and a million-dollar pension, which I sacrificed to defend Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to call us today, toll free at 866-Obey-God and make a donation. How much would you pay to defend religious liberty? Would you give $10 or $20 or $100? I bet there's some people who are watching who can even give $1,000 today just to help us stay on the air, to broadcast this into people's homes, to organize these petition drives, and especially, we spend thousands of dollars organizing rallies around the country and petitioning legislators. Please call us today at 866-Obey-God and give the best pledge that you can give to defend religious liberty and take a stand for Jesus Christ. We can't do it without you. Please donate today. Our thanks again to Colonel John Warden for that inspiring report. We need you to donate today. If you can, please visit PrayInJesusName.org or call us toll free at 866-Obey-God. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 19, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. If you are generous to our ministry, the Lord will repay you, I promise. Please visit PrayInJesusName.org. God bless you and we'll see you next time. Chaplain Klingenschmidt is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy who earned his Ph.D. in theology from Regent University. As a former Navy chaplain, by taking a public stand for freedom of speech and religious expression, and by sacrificing his own 16-year career and million-dollar pension, he was vindicated by the U.S. Congress, who changed the law and restored freedom for military chaplains to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps not only defended the Constitution, but his petitions have helped change the law in 10 states, restoring freedom to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray In Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-Obey-God. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.